And he said unto Abel, Know of thy surety that the seed thou shalt be a stranger in the land that is not theirs and shall that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall affect them, afflict them, afflict them for four hundred years. And also that nation whom they serve shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they shall come out of with great serpents. And thou shalt go to them, to thy fathers, in peace. Thou shalt not be buried in a good old village. But in the fourth generation, thou shalt come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, the old The Word of God. Great reading. Thank you. That was a lot. And we have a lot to unpack so that we can get the full gist of this uh, uh, scripture. So we're going to begin with the lesson outline that says, The Test of Abram's Faith. We all have been tested. We all have gone through some things where we have had some doubts. And we wonder if God is going to deliver on some of his promises. And we start to question God. Because we're not sure if God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And in Abram's case, he being a man, a human, he also has certain kind of concerns and, and some doubts. Even though God had already appeared to him three previous times and has delivered him and, 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 and has stated very clearly what he was going to do for him, we're at this fourth place and the fourth time that God appears before Abram to make another promise for him. So we're going to go back a little bit, and then we're going to go forward. So let's go to the beginning where it says, God had promised Abram that he would become a founder of a great nation, have a great name, and be blessed and a blessing. Now to Abram, many years later, that promise seemed to be going nowhere. How many times have you got to the point where you feel like God has forgot about his promise? That you thought of thinking, well, Lord, I guess you're not going to do what you say you're going to do. Maybe it's time for me to go to plan B. And we know what plan B is, our own way of thinking. And we forget about the word of God and the promise of God, and we get a little impatient. And when we get a little impatient, we start to question whether or not we're going to stay on the path that God wants us to stay on. How many times in your life have you been at a critical point in your life and you have veered to the right instead of staying on the path. And we all have the capacity, and there's always the temptation, especially when we're under a lot of pressure. And the pressure is what they say makes the diamond, right? right. And without any pressure, you know, life seems to just go really pretty easy. We don't really know what we're made out of until we're faced with some pressure, folks. That's when the true character of who we are shows up. And if our character isn't resting in God's faith, in God's control, we're going to make some mistakes. We're human. It doesn't mean that God does, uh, wants us to make mistakes, but he, he, he understands us. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our frailty. So in Abram's case, he's asking God, even though God has already appeared before him uh, three other times. And I want to go back in the book, in the Bible, and I want some people to read exactly. Uh, it says, this was the fourth time God came to Abram with a revelation of what laid in the future. I need someone to go to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, and read those three uh, scriptures. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Okay, that's the first time Abraham had to really step out on faith, trusting God, to leave his family, his homeland, everything that he was familiar and comfortable with, to trust 
God. To go to a place he had never been. To, to, to trust God to take him where he wanted him to go. That's what we call blind faith. But it's not blind if you trust in God. Because God already knows where you're going. You don't have to worry if God's going to get lost in the process. Because God can't get lost. So if he tells you to go, trust him. He knows where he's going to lead you. We don't have to start doubting God at that point because we don't know. If we know the God who knows it all, we don't have to worry about knowing it all. We just have to go and obey and do as he says and he's going to take care of the rest. So that was the first occasion where Abram had to just step out on his faith and trust and believe and trust God. And so he does that. Now let's go to this next one. The second time is in Genesis 12. We'll go to verse 7 and I need to read it. Genesis 12, verse 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there will be an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. <clears throat> excuse me, unto him. Are you to read that's it. No, that's it. So now he's going to build an altar to worship God. Because God has already told him about the offsprings that he's going to give the land to. So now he's, already, he's promising him that he's going to have the land and, and the offspring is going to take the land. So now the third time that God, welcome Joseph, brother-in-law. It's a family affair today, folks. <laughs> Alright, the third one is uh, Genesis 13, verses 14 through 17. I need to read it, 14 through 17. And the Lord said unto Abram, after the lot was separated right, from him, lift up nigh thy eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it, and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Amen. That's good. So now he's already now promising where the land he's going to give him, how far it is, tell him to walk it, check it out, go and look and see, as far as you can see, the north, south, east, and west. He is letting him see the land. So this is the third time. So now this takes us to where we are in our lesson today. The fourth time God comes to Abram with a revelation of what laid in the future. In this encounter, God enlarged upon the Abrahamic covenant, which was first revealed in chapter 12. This renewed revelation came out of Abram's victory over the four Mesopotamian kings. Remember in the last lesson uh, about because of that, God uh, allowed for Abram to defeat those four kings. So now, Abram's got some concerns. You know, after you defeat someone, they, they just forget about you beating them. They figure out a way to get back at you yeah. or to seek revenge. So in the back of his mind, Abram's probably wondering, I'm going to have to deal with these people because they're mad because they already got defeated. They lost their land. God has basically given it to Abram. But that doesn't mean his enemies are going to just disappear and vanish. Your enemies don't leave that easily. And, and even if they're in a disadvantaged situation, they will even matter at you and want to hurt you even more. So Abraham <coughs> has doubts. He wants to know if God's going to really do what he said he's going to do. So here we go. It says, in this incident, Abraham established himself as an enemy of those kings, which could have easily made him the target of their revenge. His absolute confidence in God, however, had caused him to act without fear. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. And so Abram had this healthy fear of who God was. He was almighty God. When we look at fear in God, we have to remember who God is, his character, and what he's going to do. Almighty God, we don't have to worry about stuff if we put our trust in almighty God. Abram had put his trust in Almighty God. So he really wasn't too concerned about doing what God asked him to do when he asked him to defeat those kings of those neighboring countries of the Mesopotamian region. We're talking about Syria, Iran, Iraq, the Middle East. 
These are the places, the land that he had defeated those kings. And they were angry, but Abraham was not fearful. Because he trusted in the Almighty God. When you're going through some stuff in your life, when you face with your enemies who are trying to destroy you, you cannot waver in your faith. If you waver in your faith, then you can't trust God. Then you're not going to have the joy of the Lord and the peace that you need when you're having to go to battle. We all have to go through some stuff in life. We all have issues that we have to deal with. We have relationships. We have people that who don't get along with us. We have neighbors that, that might not even like you. We have a, people who are looking for you for something you did long, long time ago. You may run into hardships that you had never anticipated. There's natural disasters that come on, on the scene. There's wars that break out all over the place. And you have to trust that God is able to take care of every situation that you have to deal with. Your children, they go f act funny on you. You raise them and then they act like they don't know who you are. They act like you ain't done nothing for them. But you just have to do that. And you have to deal with their craziness. And you have to trust God that he loves them even in the midst of their craziness that he's going to help them and take care of them too. And keep you sane in the process. That you're not going to go crazy because of their craziness. If you trust in God, you know it's just a process. That it's eventually going to get better because God's in control. And God loves even your enemies. So we have to be able to extend whatever it is that we're going through in the hands of God. We have to place it in God's hands. We know nobody can wrestle it out of God's hands. There's no door that can be opened that God closes. There's no door that can be closed that God opens. So everything is under God's control. And we got to remember, our loved ones, our friends, our enemies, no matter what the situation we're faced with, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what we can even think or imagine. We serve a big God, folks. We might have some big problems, but our problems are not bigger than our God. And no matter what we're going through, we got to remember God is able to deal with the problem. And He is the solution. So our solutions are are in God's hands. So what's God telling us when we're going through these trials and these tribulations? Trust God is telling what? Yes. Trust me. Yes. Trust me. Three times he's already dealt with Abram. And he's already told him, I'm going to bless you mightily. I'm going to give you what you can't even imagine I'm going to give you. And now Abram's at that point where he's saying, well, Lord, you promised me all this stuff, but now I'm in a situation I don't have a, I don't have a son. To, to leave all this stuff too. My only heir right now is uh, my servant, Eliezer. And in this society, in this culture, what was tradition is if you didn't have any uh, children to leave your inheritance to, you leave it to your servant, your most trusted servant. So Abram didn't have any kids yet. Remember? He, God promised him him kids, but Abram said, where, where is my, where is my offspring, Lord? They haven't shown up on the scene. Sarah, she's an old lady. She can't provide no new no offsprings. So he said, I got a dilemma, God. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really trusting you. I'm really believing you're going to deliver. But with my natural eye and my human reasoning, I don't see it happening. I'm an old man. My wife's an old lady. She's beyond her childbearing years. And yet you promised that I'm going to have my own child and my offspring is going to inherit all this that you promised me. Would you have some doubts if you were in Abram's situation? Would you question God at this point in your life and you say, well, God, I don't, I don't know if you can deliver on this promise because I don't have no proof that it's going to happen because I don't even have the heir that I can leave this land to. If you were in Abram's situation, would you have doubts? Would you want to question God? You think God would be upset with you if you started to say, Lord, I, I want to know. I want, I want a sign. Can you show me how this is going to play out? You think God would be offended because you want to see some evidence of, of your faith? I don't think so. Because he knows we're human. He knows how we think. 
He knows that there's limitations because we are human. So he's not going to be offended by the fact that we have a question. If your kids ask you something about you and what you want them to do, it, and it's a reasonable question, would you just say, shut up, just trust me? <laughs> I want you to go over there and get such and such from me and bring it back. And they say, why? But is it unreasonable for them to say why? Not really. I mean, if you think about it, why is a reasonable question? Yes. Now, now that's just the end of kids do let them say why. Because when we were coming on, you ain't had no why, you know. It might have been your mind, but it didn't come out your mind. Yeah, but, but you, you're right. In our generation, <laughs> we, we were taught not to question. Right, right. And if you do, you better be ready for an immediate response. <laughs> <laughs> you get questioned, but you're going to get some consequences immediately for challenging or questioning your parents' uh, good judgment. All right? Man. So, anyway, go ahead. Probably today, you know, it'll be the way they ask you. Yes, the tone of voice and attitude, right? Why, Mom? Do I have right, right. Yeah, I, said, yeah. Yeah, say, I mean, like if you, well, we need some sugar because I want to make this whatever. Okay. And we're we missing it. That. Yeah, and would you just please go to the store and pick it up and come back? Nah, we ain't saying that. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> just go to the store and get the sugar. All right. But in Abram's case, it goes and say, it was not by accident that God appeared to him afterwards with assurance that he did not need to fear and that he was going to be his shield. So in verse 1 and 2, this is how God reassured him. He said, look, after these things, the word of God came unto Abram. This is the fourth time. This time he comes in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Abram, you know me. I'm the one who took you out of earth. And I told you to go and I'm going to give you this land. I'm the one who told you you're going to have seed exceeding the stars in the sky and the sand and the dust of the, of, of the, of the sea. You're going to have them extending beyond that. And he said, I'm going to give you this land that goes from the north to the south, the east and west, that your eyes can't see. Yeah, I'm the same God. Why are you uh, tripping out? <coughs> so I'm going to give you a vision this time. So he comes to Abram in a vision on the fourth of the fifth. He said, I'm your shield, but he's going to protect him, and he's going to reward him greatly. He's going to bless him. So he wants him to know. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house, this trusted servant is Eleazar of Damascus. He just wants to know, well, Lord, how are you going to do it now? I mean, you promised me all these uh, descendants. I don't even have a seed. I'm going to end up having to leave my total inheritance to my servant. But you promised me earlier that I was going to have my own son. So what's up, Lord? When are you going to come through with this uh, promise that you made a long, long time ago to me when you said I was going to have my own seed? So that's the question. That's the challenge. So let's continue on. God was promising a continued protection, but also assured Abram that he would compensate him for his actions. After all, he had turned down the reward offered by the king of Sodom so that God himself would provide for him instead. Because the Lord wanted to be the one who got the credit for blessing Abram. Abram didn't want it to appear that the king of Sodom had done something for him. Because in the eyes of the world, the world would have believed, oh, Abram, God didn't bless you. It was the king of Sodom who gave you that stuff. <coughs> so Abram didn't want to have any doubts and he didn't want people to have any confusion that where his blessing was coming from. So he rejected the offer of the king. So that God himself would be the one who presented him with all those blessings. So that's how he covered that one. Then he goes on to say uh, about the Abrahamic covenant. It pointed to a question. What will thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus? Remember, it was custom in that day that the male servant of an heir would become the one who would be the, receive the inheritance. So that's why he was upset and questioned us. He didn't have an heir. He wanted his own bloodline to receive all the blessings. So now it says God's response. How did God respond to Abram? It says, Elazar was Abram's most trusted servant, 
and had long been a part of his household. Since Abram had not fathered a son of his own, he asked God, is this the way he planned to go? He was willing to accept the fact that maybe God was going to use the servant to continue the blessing. He was willing to accept that if that's what God was going to tell him now. He wanted his own seed, but if God says, look man, I'm going to give you Elazar to be your heir. He wouldn't have accepted it. He wouldn't have been that happy about it. Do you think, uh, Deacon? You think he, no, because he had already promised him earlier that it was going to be his own seed. So, can God lie? No. If God says he's going to do something, is God going to follow through? Yes. So, even though he was questioning whether or not God was going to do what he said, he knew God was going to deliver. He was just impatient. He just wanted to know if God changed his mind. But he knew God doesn't change his mind. And don't we sometimes go through that wishy-washy phase where we question whether or not what well, he told me, but I don't see it happening, so maybe he changed his mind. And I would bet everybody in here has thought some point in their life when they was going through something that God may have changed his mind about what he promised. That when you got real sick one time or something happened to you, you start thinking, well, maybe this is it. Maybe God's going to have me check out right now. That, 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 that other promise he made to, maybe I'm going to receive that on the other side. Or, or that child of ours who has gone astray, uh, I'm not going to see that person come around and get his life back together. <coughs> Stop the rebellion and fall back in line. I won't see that happen, but when I'm gone, God's going to still take care of it. So we start wondering, when is God's timing going to be the right timing? And we never know exactly, but we know God's timing is always the perfect timing. Yes. So we always have to wonder, Oh, God, why is it taking so long? I'm impatient. I want to see some results. And Abraham was the same. He was impatient to this point. He was an old man. He was ready. He knew he wasn't going to be living much longer. So he wanted to see some evidence that his heirs was going to be part of what God had promised him. So we go on. It says, uh, God's response. God responded quickly to the assurance that Elzar was not the heir Abram would have had directly, not through a servant. God's plan was for Abram to father his own child, so all other options were null and void. You can't question God once he's told you so. He already told you he was going to have his own child. Take God at his word, folks. Don't change the word of God. We, Abram didn't have a Bible. But he had a personal conversation with God. God was then personally instructed him. We have God's word. And all we have to do is apply God's word. And we have to believe, we have to trust that God's going to do what his word says he's going to do. We have an enormous advantage because we have all this history and all the words of these great prophets written down in a Bible for us to rely on when we're going through stuff when things have been in too much for us, when we seem to be at our wit's end and we're ready to give up. All we have to do is go to the Word of God, get some encouragement, get some direction, and keep pushing. Amen. Keep pushing. It's all there for us. He's not playing any tricks with us. He's not trying to deceive us. But he's just simply laying out his Word because uh, this week we had a Bible study said with his Word we have, we're in distress, trouble. And God sent his word and he did well with us. He healed us. And he, he, and he got us out of our trouble. Why? Because God's our protector. God's our shield. God's going to come to our aid. He already said he'll do that. But we question whether or not God's going to do it. When we're in the pressure, when we're in the situation, we start wondering, maybe this is it. That's our flesh. <laughs> our flesh rise up against us. And we start looking with our eyes instead of with our faith. Remember, faith is not what we see. <clears throat> faith is something we don't see. We walk by faith and not by sight. Remember, Abram was a man of faith. So he walked by faith. He didn't go by what, what the situation was, who was in office, how our bank account was looking, what kind of friends we associated with, 
the type of house we lived in, the cars we drive. He didn't, he didn't equate his life with material things. He equated his life with whether or not he was believing and trusting God in faith. Because he knew all of his answers, all of his problems could be solved by God himself. And when we get in situations where we know we can't handle it, when we know it's beyond our pay rate, we got to be able to give it to God. Because we know God's going to come through for us at the right time. Why is he not going to come when we want to? Because we're too uh, unpredictable. We're too moody. Our, we, we go by our feelings too much. We, some days we feel good. Some days we feel horrible. And some days we don't even like people. Some days we like don't. Uh, we, we, we love them to death. Some days we don't even like ourselves. Some days we can't even get along with ourselves. Yeah, we have a hard time even liking ourselves. Man. And most of the time, that might be the case. Because that's why we're depressed. Because we don't even like ourselves. Not that we don't like God. We have to be something about ourselves because we tend to let ourselves down a lot. Yeah. We promise to do something we can't keep our own promises. Amen. We know God will keep his promise, but we can't, even, we can't even trust ourselves to keep our own promises. That's pretty bad because that's how human beings are. Yeah. We, we fall short all the yeah. time. We're sinners saved by grace. Yeah. If it wasn't for the grace of God, where would we be today? Yeah. <clears throat> all of us have been in some situations that we never should have got into. And some situations we never should have got out of. We should have been dead and buried a long time ago if it had not been for God being on our side. Because we put ourselves in harm's way and we know we were with some people we shouldn't have been with. But by the grace of God, He kept us. So we're here today because God had a plan for us. He knew in the pardons of our sins that one day we would come to know his son Jesus Christ in the pardons of our sins and God would do what only he could do and that's change us from the inside out because remember, we're just as filthy rags on our best day. So if we get all pumped up thinking we all that, we just need to remember on our best day, in God's eyes, we're just filthy rags. <coughs> There is nothing we could have done to earn the gift of salvation. We couldn't have been good enough. We couldn't have been smart enough. We couldn't look good enough. We couldn't have had enough money. You couldn't have done it by your works. You couldn't have earned it no matter how hard you had tried. The only thing that could get you to what God has given us to have salvation was his grace and mercy. So when we think about the goodness of the God and all that he's done for us. Our soul should cry out every day. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. Because if it hadn't been for God on our side, we would all be dead, sleeping in our graves. Today, we would not be able to be here today. It's only because God loved us. And that's why he sent his son. Because we never could have got it right. We needed a Savior. Yes. God sent His only begotten Son so that we would have an opportunity one day to accept Him. Yes. To believe that He was the Son of God and to trust Him and receive the gift that only He could give. A free gift. You couldn't earn it and you couldn't buy it. It's only by God's freedom of, of love for us. So that's why we have to really humble ourselves. And it's, sometimes we get all puffed up. Um, who we are. Yeah. We, we give ourselves way too much credit. Amen. We really do. We give ourselves too much credit and we don't give enough people enough credit. Amen. We always have a tendency to lift ourselves up a little higher and we always have a tendency to look our nose down. Amen. That's human nature. Because we're always self-centered, folks. <laughs> Everything we see is through our own eyes until God gets a hold of us and says, look, it's only because of my son that you can really see what's really there. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh only produces death. So until we receive Jesus, we really can't help to do but crazy stuff. And even after we receive Jesus, we still have our crazy moments. <laughs> Don't we have our crazy moments? Yeah. yeah. We have some thoughts we shouldn't be thinking. We got, have some things we do we shouldn't do. We have some actions that we shake our hands and say, 
I thought I was over there. Yeah. I thought I was beyond doing that crazy stuff. Yeah. And then you have to ask for God to forgive you. Repent. Yeah. Yeah. And then he's faithful and just to, to forgive us. Yeah. And cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Because it's all about God's righteousness that we're seeking. Because yeah. we can't get any righteousness on our own. It's only by living in faith in Christ that we can receive the gift of righteousness. Abram is a man of faith and he's going to receive righteousness because God's going to credit righteousness because of what he believed. So in other words, we have to believe first. We have to have trust in God and then guess what we get? It's all that God gives us. God gives us righteousness. We're not righteous in ourselves. There is no righteousness in us. Amen. There's nothing good in us if we can just throw ourselves away. <laughs> It's the righteousness that God imputes in us when he gives us the Holy Spirit. Because then the Holy Spirit produces the righteousness of God. We can't produce it. We have to understand we're helpless and we're powerless to change our conditions. It's only by God's power. That's the Holy Spirit that can transform us from the inside out and make us the way God wants us to be. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He, pre he created it, and he's going to finish it. Even when we don't want to do it, God's going to find a way to make us do it. That's the blessing. That even when we at our wits end and we're ready to give up, God provides a way for us. And he produces, he'll bring some people into your life that you didn't expect. He'll bring some situation that you didn't know was coming your way, and it'll help you to open your eyes and see that there's, there's something better for you. Or then he'll bring a person in your life to make you feel better, to, to, to help you, get, to guide you, help you along, to encourage you, and to support you. God has ways that we cannot think of to meet our needs. We cannot rely on our own thinking ability. It's always going to be inadequate. Only thing that's going to get us where we need to go from point A to point B is to obey God. So if God's telling you something today and you've been ignoring Him and you say, well, Lord, I'm going to put this on the back burner for a while because I got some other things I want to try to work out myself. Don't we always have a plan B that God's got to wait for first? And, 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 and we don't rationalize it to God. We, we, we can be very convincing. We can make a compelling argument that God, you know, let me try this first and then if it don't work out, then I'll come back and I'll check with you. I'll check with you. And then we go ahead and we go and do our plan B and fail as usual. And we hope God is still going to be there waiting for us when we have to admit, Lord, you're right. I should have did it. I just should have waited on you. I didn't trust you enough, but you know, forgive me, Lord. Give me another chance. Yeah. Trust me, I'll, I'll, I'll do it better next time. And we bargain with God. And we bargain with Him all the time. But He loves us enough to listen. He'll listen to you. And laugh at us too, probably at the same time. Because He knows how ridiculous we are. <laughs> yes, Joe? But we want instant gratification. The flesh wants to be pleased right now. And that's why we always end up in trouble because we want we want what we want when we want it. We talk about infants. An infant wants what he wants when he wants it right now. And you know you'll get that thought in your head too when you're trying to do it now. You're like, no, you need to wait. You're like, no, I'm gonna do it. You need to wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you get the alarm is going off. Yeah. You're saying you're about to go down the wrong road, right. and if you just just wait a second, you'll be okay. But don't do what your your first mind tells you. Because it's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Yes, that's right. And you know, God's an untimed God. He's not going to give you what you want anyway. No. Because you don't need everything. You don't need it. No, you don't no. need it. We want stuff we don't need. Exactly. So God's not going to give it to us even though we're asking for it. He's going to give us what we need. Exactly. He knows what we need. And He knows exactly what we need. And He knows some of the things that we want is the things that we don't need. Right. <laughs> right. right. So, so Abram is still dealing with uh, a lot of promise and uncertainty, and he knows that uh, Eleazar, being his uh, servant that he would, would naturally leave his estate to, that God said, don't worry about that, i got something for you. And he lets him see what? All the stars in the sky and the sands on the sea, and said, this will be your inheritance. He says, 
it says right here, it says, the sky and the multitudes and the sands which is by the seashore is innumerable. He also knew that Sarah was physically incapable of conceiving, so Abram could see no other solution. He thought he couldn't produce <coughs> the seed, but God is going to make it. <coughs> what was Abram's response? He said he believed the Lord, and he counted to him for what? Righteousness. This was not the moment of Abram's conversion that had occurred, because he had already believed God where? When he left Ur? Rather than the emphasis being on complete trust in the Lord, that what he had said would become a reality, the importance of such faith in Abram's life is emphasized in three passages. I just want to read one of them, because they all basically say the same thing. Some will go to Romans 4, verse 3. And, and the other two verses basically say the same thing in Galatians 3, 6 and James 2, 23. Romans 4, 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him to righteousness. He believed God. That's where we got to be, folks. No matter what situation we find ourselves in, no matter what trial, no matter what the tribulation is, we have to believe God. We have to trust Him. That's where faith is. Faith is not something that just you can just turn on and off when you feel like it. We have to, to be a lifestyle of faith. As believers in Christ, we have to be living faith every day. We have to believe God no matter what the situation is going to come up because we never know what's going to happen from day to day. Surprise is always around the corner. We always have to be ready for the unexpected. And when the unexpected shows up, we got to immediately lock in to believing God. I'm going to trust God. Let me go to the Word and make sure I understand what God would want me to do in this situation. And then when I find out what the Word says, i got to do it. This is where we get in trouble. We'll read the word and then we'll say, I ain't going to do it. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. That's something we're talking to keep the eye in the dollar. I can do this. Right. I can do it. And you know, it just take time. I, I, I think I do it a little more now. Just sit back and kind of evaluate the situation. Why you evaluate the most time God is coming to you and kind of tell you what you should do? Wait on the Lord. Wait on it. Say, that's the key. If we don't wait on it. We would say, oh, well, Lord, you ain't done what I wanted you to do. So I'm going to take it into my own hands. I'm going to snatch it right out of his hands and say, well, okay, Lord, it didn't happen fast enough, so I think it's okay for me to go ahead and exercise my plan B now. Because I need to do something. I'm desperate. Desperate people do desperate things. And we live to regret them. Yes? Uh, one of the things I always say is, yes. Hardest thing to have a good mind when yeah. you're trying to walk by faith because some of us think we're so smart, but we are. Like, yeah, just, <coughs> I'm a people person, I can figure it out, I'm a problem solver, I'm this, I have this education, I have this experience, I have this wisdom, and that's what gets in the way. We put too much faith in ourselves. We put too much faith in ourselves. So yeah. even when I assess, yeah. I'm assessing it through yeah. my lens instead of actually connecting with God and allowing Him to show me the things that He wants me. I'm trying to figure it out because I'm that smart. And we don't want to admit that, yep, I'm really relying on my strength, my ability, instead of God. Yeah, so God, let's think about it. Almighty God, the creators of the heaven and the earth. I'm going to match up with him. Yeah, I'm going to figure it out. He's the one that created my body. He's the one who gave me this brain. But yet, I ain't going to trust him. I'm smarter than he is. And he's the one who made me to get the stuff in my head in the first place. I couldn't even think of the God that gave me the ability to think it. But yet I'm going to still ignore him and put my thoughts ahead of his thoughts. How crazy is that? We're all crazy, aren't we? <laughs> it's insanity, but go ahead. I understand your thoughts for all. Yeah. Gonna think right. Before you, before you think it. Yes. I know what's the word of God is mighty and sharper than a two-edged sword. Yeah. God knows the intents and the thoughts that we have, even the motives behind our thoughts. That's how deep God is. 
And we do stuff and we say stuff and we don't even know why we did it. Don't say it. But yet we can trust God who knows it all. Boy, I, we, we are incredible. Yes. You know, time and time again, God has proven himself to me because time I've like, gone through things. I, I just can't do this. I don't understand it. You know, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do it. Right, right. You know, right. And all of a sudden, it happened. Out of nowhere, right? Out of nowhere. It, it happened. God provides the answer. The same thing I said, I can't do or I don't see that, I can't figure it out. God do it. You know what? You, the point you just raised, God's just waiting us to get to the point where we say, Lord, be still. I can't do it. <laughs> And you know what I'm saying? I know you can't. I've been waiting for you to get to that point where you say that you can't do it. I need your help. When we keep trying to struggle with it on our own, a lot of the struggles we are going through is because we won't let God do it. We won't ask Him for help. We got too much pride. I can do it myself, Bill. That's why we don't get the help God wants to do because He's waiting for you to say, Lord, I need you. You can't do it. Yes. Praise the Lord. Congratulations. God. They said, how did you do it? I said, God. God did it. When I was on my way to hell. Right. In a hole. And when I gave it to him, I said, take it away from me. Because I can't do this. And please don't give it back. And once you did that, God shows you a bit. There's people right here on the top of my voice. They're struggling with some stuff. And you don't know which way to turn. Uh -huh. But all you got to do is cry out to God. He hears your distress. He knows what you're going through. He wants to reach out and pull you out of your muck and your mind. He wants to rescue you, but he wants you to call from him. He just wants you to say, Daddy, can you help me? I'm in bad shape. I'm about to leave out of here. If you don't come rescue me, I'm gone. Call on him. He's ready to do it for you right now. In an instant. He's almighty God. He's a God of miracles. He will do anything he wants to do. But he wants you to call on him. He's not going to force you to do anything against your will. He's willing, but you got to be willing to call him. That's a relationship. Yes. Pigeon, but there was one other too, a goat. 
And he said that you had to split them, right? Because God's making a covenant. A covenant from God is not conditional. It's unconditional. unconditional. God's going to do this by himself. He don't need us to do it. And we want an unconditional covenant with God. Not based on anything that we do. Because we might as well be like the Judaizers. Think we can earn our salvation. We can't earn it. It's a free gift. So God's going to show Abram by splitting these animals. And God's going to show up in the, with the fire. Because God's presence is always fire. And he's going to walk through it. Because the custom is, you split them in half, that bonds the relationship. That brings the two parties together. But you need somebody that's going to walk through it. In this case, God walking by himself. Abram doesn't come, come along. God is making a universal, unilateral, unconditional covenant that he's going to be the one that grants the conditions, that supplies all of the blessings. He's going to do it because he promised it. God's promised you something. Hold on to it. Don't question it. Claim it, receive it, and thank it. Don't question it anymore, folks. When you got situations where you don't know it's going to work out, don't play that game. Say, Lord, I give it to you. I already received it. Claim it. It's yours. Faith is the substance of things hopeful. And the evidence of things not seen. So we got to start walking in faith and claiming what we want. we got to claim our victories. we got to claim our, 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 our enemies are going to vanish and disappear. we got to trust God. He's going to do the work for us. And so God seals the covenant with Abram. And that's why he used the animals. And the last thing he does, he shows Abram this. There are going to be bad times, hard times. There's going to be troubles. And he showed him that for 400 years, his descendants were going to be in captivity. Even though you might be receiving the gifts and the promises, you're going to go through some stuff. And you're going to go through some mess. And you're going to deal with some messy people. And it's going to be hard. And it's going to test your faith. But guess what? If God promised you, you're still going to get it. You're going to get it. And it took them 400 years to get out of Egypt. But God was good on his promise. And the Egyptians got out of Egypt, claimed the land, took all that money out of Egypt, and when they got to the promised land, they were loaded. Yeah. <laughs> they were loaded. Guess what? When we get to heaven, folks, we're going to be loaded. Yeah. Yeah. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your example of Abram showing exemplary faith. Father, you're basically telling us that's what you expect from us. You expect us to believe in you. You expect us to trust you with all our heart. You expect us to have faith enough to receive from you the righteousness that only comes from God. Father, today I hope everyone here will receive faith from you to enable their muscles of faith to grow stronger. That no matter what situation that they're in, no matter how bleak it might look, no matter how dire the circumstance may become, that they'll look to the hills from where the help comes from because they will know their help comes from the Lord. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives, how you're increasing our faith to know that we need to obey you, to trust in you, and you will deliver on all your promises that your word has for us. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for these people here. I hope that you will meet all of them at their point of need and they will apply and put into effect your words, and that their faith will be exemplary. We trust you and we love you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Have a blessed, you should, oh, bless the food, folks, that we're about to receive for our nourishment. We ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.